Hello, I'm Maya, and it's the final week of this challenge. I'm following this prompt list and making a painting every day of July with Pokemon and general beachy or summery vibes. These are the ones that are left for this week. I also went to an art market, and I'll be sharing how that went near the end of this video. But let's get into it. For Murky, I originally wanted to do a scene that was almost exactly like Rain, but I didn't because they were too similar. So I went with the concept of murky depths deep under the ocean, with an inke as the central point of the painting. Right away, I thought I screwed up by adding those green light rays, but I was happy with how the blending from the light to dark blue was going. Near the end there, I kind of panicked and tried to get rid of some of the green. <laughs> and despite it being dry, the paper is not laying flat, so that's just an added bit of whimsy and fun while I paint. I start off by painting the whooper. And I had to throw a polytoad into this painting just because I love polytoads too. And a Dratini, because Dratini is, it's got this magical aura to it. I used to love them when I was a kid. And painting these love discs was super satisfying. And I was surprised how well the pink translated even on top of the blue paint. And while sketching this painting, I could not for the life of me remember the name of Corsola. I had to look it up again what its name was. I knew vaguely what it looked like, but I could not look up the right things to get Google to show me a picture. I think the search pink water Pokemon eventually got me what I was looking for. And I also just learned that there's a Galarian variant of Corsola. Which is so sad. <laughs> it's in reference to our core reefs that are dying. But I decided to not use the Galarian variant because the ghostly branches would have been harder to draw. And because the pink fit the color scheme better. And also because the Galarian one is so sad. Look at it. Look at this card of it. It's, it's dead and sad. <laughs> And on to painting the Inke. I love Inke. I had this image as my background for years on my first laptop. My first laptop was a hand-me-down from my older brother who put the Linux distro crunch bang on it. And now I have this strange nostalgia that connects Inke to Minecraft, GIMP, the paint program, and crunch bang. GIMP and Minecraft because that's like the only apps I ever used on that computer. I think in honor of those times, I'll make this picture my wallpaper again. But I'm not putting Crunchbang on this computer. I'm sorry, Linux. You're always a good idea in theory, but not in practice. No hate, I just like being able to run Windows applications. And regardless of my nostalgia that I have for Inke, it's such a cute Pokemon, and the way that it evolves is so creative. Like, are you kidding me? You flip it upside down, and then Malamar, like, looks like a squid upside down. Like, it's so cool. Oh, it's so cool. Tentacool only wishes it was, like, a fraction as cool as Malamar or Inke. And speaking of other cool squids, Toad School is pretty cool. What's up with that naming convention? The cool with the squids? I don't... Is that some pun I don't get? I Like it's Toad School? Like a school? I don't know. I don't get it. But 
Toad School is really funny to watch walk around in Scarlet and Violet. They just, their legs are so silly. I feel like they made that Pokemon specifically to have them like wander around in the overworld like that. But this painting is coming to an end. I'm doing the finishing touches. I'm painting in Inkay's eyes. And I'm removing the masking fluid. Always, always so satisfying. Especially when it doesn't rip your paper. And this is how it looks without colored pencil. And here's the reveal. The word for today is hearth. Unrelated, but I used this brush the whole challenge. But I've come to realize it's not good. It's a round synthetic haired brush, just like all my other brushes I like. But it just doesn't hold water like my other brushes and it has very firm bristles. And this annoys me, so I'm putting it away. If you use a royal Taclon brush like this and wonder why watercolor is so hard, that might be why. Or in general, your brushes might be sabotaging you. But anyways, this is my plan for this painting. The fire will be a bright yellow. Then I want that to fade into red. And at the edges of the painting, I want it to be a warm brown. And I want the shadow that the Pokemon cast to be a cool dark blue. So for the background, I only use these four paints. My objective for Hearth was simple. To make some cute Pokemon sleeping in front of a fire and make it cozy and warm. I chose Arcanine because it's a big, fluffy, cute Pokemon. I chose Eevee because it's a small, fluffy, cute Pokemon. There really wasn't much more thought into it than that. In this part of the painting, I'm doing like a majority of the painting. I'm putting down some very wet paint and then transitioning between those three colors I talked about. And now I'm putting in that blue shadow. I maybe should have practiced the blue shadow first because I couldn't commit to how it looked. I end up going back over the blue and painting more brown over top of it. I also find it endlessly amusing to watch paint dry in fast motion. So here's a clip of that. I found that the more paint I add, the more convinced I am that this painting will turn out okay. Just the small things, like painting the wall and a shadow beneath the fireplace really changed it for me. I guess I wanted the shadow to be darker, so I'm painting it brown. And it would have just been Poor safety practice to not have a railing over the fireplace. And there I go again, painting over the shadow, but this time I mixed the blue and the dark brown paint so it is cool tinted. And I can't forget to add the brown stripes on the Arcanine and its little nose. I think that setting a strong light source in a watercolor painting is a lot of fun. It's fun to think about which areas are cast in shadow, which colors are going to gradate, uh, just from which direction the light is coming from. And again, I'm just adding more paint and it's making the scene like so much better. It's, it's crazy how just differences in tones change everything. Like, most things in this painting are the same color, they're just like a variant of cadmium. But changing the value, I think, adds a lot.
Like once I paint in the Arcanine's orange fur, it really helps it stand out from the background. It may be coming darker, but it's standing out because it's a, it's a vivid color now. I was actually going to keep it just as it was, but I decided to give it a try after I painted that carpet and I liked how it looked. Also the carpet is very hard, it's kind of hard to see where it is, but once I move my hand you should be able to see the carpet. But that's nearly the end of this painting, so here's the reveal. For this prompt, I really wanted to give a cloak to a Pokemon who doesn't usually have one. So I chose Psyduck, of course. I was very inspired by Oliver Hamlin for this piece. They also work in watercolor and are always painting the most cute Psyducks. And after looking at their recent works, it seems like they're also doing a summer Pokemon series. So definitely check out their work. But the painting process for this one was kind of as simple as it gets. I think this painting has five colors in total. So to spice it up, I add some orange into the shadow areas. And I threw some sparkles on there for good measure. And the way Psyduck is looking at me, he kind of reminds me of Senshi from Dungeon Meshi. It's definitely the eyes, I think. Also, this video should be coming out on August 7th, and at the end of this video I sell some art at a local art market, but I may have signed up to do a last second anime convention on August 10th to 11th. It's called Anime 414, and it'll be at the Baird Center. I won't show myself prepping for this convention, not in this video, mostly because there isn't much prep I have to do. But if you're interested in how the market is, let me know and I can make a video on it. Or check out my Instagram because I'm bound to show some behind the scenes during that convention. I can't believe they still had spots available though. I signed up last Friday. I feel like that's super unheard of for an anime convention. Usually you have to like book the spot like months in advance, but this is a first time event, an inaugural event. I learned what that word meant because of this. <laughs> so if you're around the Milwaukee area during this weekend, come by, check it out. I think there's tickets still available. I'm super excited to go. I also got a corner booth, so maybe I'll change my setup a bit. I don't know, that's exciting. Never had a corner booth before. Also on this painting, I am painting in an invisible color. I thought it was necessary. It, I must say it doesn't add much. I added some shadows to his eyes and they're, they're invisible all right. And we've got to paint in the little Psyduck hairs. This is something I've talked about before, but I feel like with watercolor, you should really leave white areas, especially around highlights. You can see his, the top of his head there. I actually remembered to leave like a white area. I'm proud of myself for that. I find that when I'm painting, I just get so into it, I want to like cover everything with paint. But you shouldn't do that, you should leave white spots. And white spots beyond the obvious ones like 
the whites in his eyes. I think those were pretty obvious. And now I'm just adding in some details to the bill. And after this, well, once I smooth out that shadow there. After this, I just paint the cape. I just do it in one go. And I paint it. And after the cape, it's time for the reveal. We did it! Last day, let's go! So if you remember back to the original prompt list, the last word is cozy. But that word wasn't gonna work. I think other paintings I've done capture cozy, especially hearth, which I just did. So I changed it to something more fitting of the vibes of this challenge. The new prompt word is sir. I may have put a lot of pressure on myself for this painting to turn out great, and to ensure that it does. I did two practice paintings. This first one is to test a wet on wet wave and to test out using tape to mask off specific areas. Because I can't trust my masking fluid to cover large areas. This is something I've seen other artists do, but I was hesitant because I don't understand how they could cut the tape and not the paper too. But once you try it, you can see how much pressure to use to cut the tape. It was easier than I expected, and I think I might have cut the paper a tiny bit in some areas, but it's not noticeable and doesn't affect how the watercolor behaves. Just be sure to use a new sharp X-Acto blade. And for the wave painting, I referenced this wave tutorial by Matthew White, Watercolor Instruction. Like I said, I had high expectations and wanted to research how other people did waves. This is how this one turned out. For the other wave, I wanted to try a more controlled, wet on, dry approach. Because this technique is easy to control, I didn't think masking was necessary. And here are the tests side by side. I like the way the waters interact and behave on the wet and wet one, so that's what I'll be using for the final painting. And on to the real deal. Unfortunately, quite a few clips from this painting got corrupted, so I don't have too much footage of me adding tape but I have these, and that whole process went pretty smooth. The next thing I did was wet my paper, like drench my paper. Then I let it sit for a little bit so that the paper could really absorb the water. And I just started painting. I work with the light colors first. I wanted the wave to have the light green like the sun is shining through the water and for the other parts to be a deeper blue. As the paper got more dry, I used less water and more paint in my mixtures to ensure that the pigments really came through and didn't just get washed away by the wet paper. I used a dry, flat brush to pull away the pigment and enforce the shininess on the water. It was nice because the flat edge and stiffer bristles gave me a lot of control. Then I went back in and added more of that green into some areas to kind of create a bit of a glowy look. And that's a majority of the painting. I just need to peel off the tape now and paint those parts. When I was peeling off the tape from the first test, the paper ripped a bit. This was because I didn't let the paper dry all the way. But I'm pretty sure it'll be fine this time. I gave it ample time to dry. And 
And yeah, that went well. The paper did not tear. I wanted the white parts to have just a hint of blue shadow. And I really wanted to emphasize the reflected green light on the Blastoise. I did do a color test for this painting, so this is what I was referencing while painting him in. I think it's so funny to paint the tiny details on the background winkle. And again, I lost most of the footage of me painting the Blastoise. So here's a sick transition of before and after. But you didn't miss much, I just did a similar process to his shell. I placed down the light green, then came in with the other colors, and painted up to the green to let them blend together. I'm really happy with how it turned out though. Now it's just the final touches for the wingles and the surfboard. Okay, and for funsies, I used some watered down white gouache to make some splatters. And here's how it turned out. I may have finished all the paintings, but there is still an art market I need to go to. Where we last left off on the art market prep saga, I was matting paintings well into the night on Saturday. Once I got those done, I just immediately went to bed and woke up bright and early on Sunday to pack up my mess and go to Discovery World. I'm so sorry, I'm not much of a vlogger, so I didn't take that much video of me setting up my booth or really me being at my booth, but it was a super cool event. There was live music, food, an outdoor area, and free yoga in the morning. Most people there were local makers and everyone I talked to was incredibly nice. I didn't get a good chance to walk around though and like say hi to some people that I wanted to. I've also only sold at one other event, which was an anime convention. And the differences between an anime convention and an art market were interesting. Both of these events were in the same area, but I noticed a big difference in the people who attended. The art market just had a more diverse bunch of people. I even had some people who were asking me which Pokemon are popular because they wanted to get something for their kids who like Pokemon. Which was so cute! And for the first time, someone asked me to sign a print. And I said sure, and promptly signed the back of the print. But now that I think about it, maybe I should have, like, asked which side they wanted signed. I noticed that it really took me, like, an hour to get into the NPC mindset. It doesn't come naturally to me, but it's fun to just talk with people and do customer service type things. In all the jobs I've had, I actually enjoy customer service. I just, I like talking to people and helping people. Also, seeing how people react to your art is always, like, the most rewarding. Some other things I noticed. People were more hesitant to take business cards than people are at anime conventions. People mostly bought things in the $5 to $15 range. The oopsie stickers I put out were very popular. And almost no one paid with cash. Like, 90% of my transactions were with card and Venmo for some reason. And I think I do want to be transparent with how much I made. I don't see the harm in it, and I think it's helpful to anyone else looking to sell at a similar event. 
So the price of the table was $90 with a $5 deposit. I spent $25 on the prints, $5 on the display baskets I got from Goodwill, and I spent $20 on things at the market while I was there. But my gross profit was $387. And minus those other expenses, the net income was $242. Which, if I'm being brutally honest, I kind of expected more, but I feel really bad saying that. To be fair, I didn't know what to expect. I've never done an event like this. And that total is just from one day. I did make a profit and made some valuable connections at the event. So yeah, I think it was worth it. And I would 100% go again. And I am going again in December. But it was so much fun. Afterwards, I immediately made this tea that I got from Tootsie's Tea while I was there. I got the dragon fruit punch flavor and it was, it was so good. <laughs> But that's the end of Pokey July. Thank you so much for watching. Here's all the paintings corralled together. Per usual, let me know which painting was your favorite. That could be from the video today or any painting from the series. Follow me on Instagram at Pumpkin Pancakes to see what I make next. And check out the playlist that has the other videos from this series if you missed any of them. Also, I may be sad that it's over, but you know who's not? Pepper. She's so happy. When I stopped using my other desk to paint, I put her bed back on it and just, just look at her. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.